Laminance, or by its short name, LUM, is the ultimate silver bullet to get your pictures great. They will have less noise, more contrast, more details, they're sharper, they're just better. And it also restores world peace. That's at least what about every YouTuber, um, including me, <laughs> tries to tell you. But is this really the ultimate truth? In this video, we will look at what laminance really is, what the effect is that it has, how to use it properly, when to not use it, and what the disadvantages of it are. All of that will probably blow your mind. Hey, this is View Into Space. I'm Sascha from Switzerland. So grüß Sie miteinander and thanks for watching my channel. Before we start, I have something important to tell you. Beside the usual stuff, that you should subscribe, that you should have a look at my Patreon channel. The important part is, please, 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 for this one video, stick with me until the end. This is a little bit of a complex topic. I have to give an introduction, but what it all boils down to is really something that will help you for doing a better and more efficient processing. So stick with me. So let's start pretty basic. What is luminance? It's quite easy. When light falls on our sensor, then we capture two information. One is the color, which is either defined by the filter of a monocam or by the Bayer matrix in a one-shot color camera. The other thing we're measuring is how many photons per time are actually hitting the sensor on a certain pixel. And that is luminance. With that knowledge, let's look now at a typical case where laminance makes a lot of sense. Let's assume I have a mono camera and I shoot an RGB object, for example, a galaxy. So let's say I shoot for an hour in red, I shoot for an hour in green and for an hour in blue. So I have color data per color, one hour. Now do I have three hours of luminance data? Not really, because let's look at it like this. We have the light in all the colors flowing from above. The red, the blue, the green. But when I put a filter in front of the camera, I block actually two of these glasses and only one of the three streams of photons reaches the sensor. So assuming that each of the colors is flowing evenly, and that's a wrong assumption, but for the sake of the argument, let's at the moment take this assumption, we only gather a third of the light per filter, which means we have, instead of the three hours, only one hour worth of luminance. Now to gather the color is rather easy. I don't need so much integration time to know what color a certain part of the picture has. It's the luminance which is crucial. This is what gives the details. This is what gives the contrast. This is what gives the structure. Now I can say I shoot one hour per color and then I shoot another three hours luminance. And these three hours luminance, they're worth from a luminance point of view like if I would have shot nine hours, the colors again. So three hours per color. So instead of 12 hours overall integration time, I could actually break it down to six hours to half. And I have practically the same information. And that's a typical case where luminance makes a lot of sense. But here is the first learning. I still need to shoot more luminance than I would have gathered with the colors. So if I would say I just shoot one hour per color and one hour luminance, it's pointless because I already gathered one hour of luminance through the three hours of the colors. So then I do not gain anything. Now you might say, well, this is about mono, but what about one shot color? Now let's think about it for a moment. With one shot color, we have the Bayer matrix. Let's fix. And the Bayer matrix is like the filters we use 
in mono. So even if we shoot without a filter, one shot color, we're always limited by the Bayer matrix. So it's by default RGB and the photons of the wrong color, they will simply diminish. So with that, we come to learning number two. You cannot shoot real luminance with a one shot color camera. And you might argue, well, I go in Pix Insight and I extract the luminance. Yes, you can do that, but you get in the exact same amount of luminance that you would have had in the RGB picture. So there is not more luminance available. And in principle, we can call this already synthetic loom. And I will come to that in a moment. Let's park that. And let's go back to mono. In mono, when we shoot narrow band, a J03 S2, we cannot use the loom filter because what we want to do with narrow band is actually cut out the light pollution to shoot faint nebula. If we then would shoot with the luminance filter, we will get all the light pollution in again. That's pointless. So here the alternative is synthetic loom. And there's a million of YouTube videos which give fancy recipes to create synthetic loom. But you can actually, you don't even have to look at a YouTube video for that. You can simply integrate the HA, O3 and S2 together and you have a synthetic loom. Or use pixel mass and just move them together. That's it. So this is not the point. But whenever we're talking about synthetic loom, we have to be aware that in principle, we do not have more loom that we actually already have in the separate emissions or separate colors. So is synthetic loom a joke? Does it make no sense at all? That's also not true. And by the way, there's a very good video of Lucomatico, um, which he did about a year ago, and I will put a link to that in the description below, where he actually does the experiment. He shoots a galaxy once with real luminance, one with synthetic luminance and once without luminance, and he compares them. And obviously the real luminance gives the best result, but the synthetic luminance gives a better result than without the loom. So there must be something. Now the reason is that even in the RGB picture, the color channels are treated separately. Now with a synthetic loom, we're actually adding up the luminosity of all three channels. And so at the end, we have a better signal to noise ratio. And so from that point of view, a synthetic loom has its value, but not in every case. Why is that? And here we come to really to the core of the whole story. What did Luke take? A galaxy. When we talk about galaxies, about star clusters, about stars, Stars exist out of every color. There's some blue in there, there's some green in there, there's some red in there. And depending on the star colors, this varies a little bit, but all three colors exist in these stars. And so there is something to add up. And so there's also no wonder that in this case, the synthetic luminance has its value. But let's go now to narrowband shooting. Here we record emissions. And emissions usually don't match. Sometimes they overlap, but not always. And that means that in a lot of cases, especially where you have a lot of HA, there is not much which goes on top of that luminosity wise from the O3, from the S2 channel. And that minimizes the value of synthetic loom when we talk about narrow band shooting. Now you might ask, well, if there's not a lot of value, is there a lot of harm that can be done if I anyway do the synthetic loom? First of all, it's a lot of work. It's, it's a full separate stream you have to do. And you can save that if you don't do the synthetic loom. That's one thing. And the other thing, and that might be personal, I might be an idiot <laughs> and I accept that. But personally, I struggle to stretch black and white pictures in the right way. I usually do color combination before the stretch. 
and I feel I get too much, the better results in stretching a color picture than stretching a grayscale picture. And from that point of view, I personally feel more comfortable just working when it goes to narrow band without a loom. Now, if you made it so far, let's do a summary and then I will treat you with something extra because you stuck around. So what did we learn? A, definitely real laminance is the real thing. And when you shoot mono RGB, it definitely makes sense to shoot laminance, but you have to do it in an enough long duration, which means you shoot the main part of the integration time in loom and only a residual part in RGB. Second, we learned that in RGB pictures, galaxies, star clusters, stars, a synthetic luminance might actually improve your picture. And third, we learned that when it comes to narrowband shooting, I would rather discourage you from using synthetic loom. And so with that, let's come to the little extra story because I had an absolute ingenious idea. I got from Antlia this R plus filter, which is an IR pass filter. So it only lets the infrared light or near infrared light to pass. And infrared has a lot of advantages because it's not influenced by seeing. It even actually penetrates the clouds if they're not too strong. And a lot of stars actually emit infrared more than the visible light. So my ingenious idea was, why not use infrared as loom instead of loom? And so I actually with Andromeda, I tried that and that's the result. Now that doesn't look too bad, does it? But look at the difference. This is now with real laminance. So lesson learned. Genius idea is not so genius because first of all, not all stars emit IR, which means you have less stars. Second of all, the ones who do, they really shoot a lot of IR, which means you get a lot of halos. And then the galaxy doesn't really shoot IR so cool. So you actually lose a lot of the structure here of the faint nebulosity. So no, no, doesn't work. It was a nice experiment, but if you ever, <laughs> but if you ever should get to the same idea, I can already tell you now, no, doesn't work. Okay, and that was it. I'm interested to hear your opinion about this topic. If you're agreeing with me or that you feel that in narrowband synthetic laminates also make sense. And if you feel that, I would be interested about your reasoning. And so, see you next time and clear skies.